Hi, Kyle. How are you doing? It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, nice to talk to you, too. Yeah. Nice to talk. Hey, congratulations on this live record. It is a whole lot of fun to listen to. Thank you. It's um, doing well over here. It's gone to number one in the Amazon charts uh, in the UK, so I'm, uh, I'm very happy with that. It's all downhill from here, of course, you know, but there we go. <laughs> nice down- to get some good news. All downhill from here. That's right. <laughs> There is a concept behind this. Do you want to do you want to set up the concept before we get too far into it? Oh sure. Well, you know, I was celebrating the 40th anniversary of Wind and Wuthering, which was released in 1977. So, uh, the 40th birthday was 2017. So, off the Genesis set, we do quite a few numbers from that. I don't do the album in its entirety. I just do what I think is the strongest stuff from it, which means we do uh, an 11th Earl of Mar, One for the Vine, Blood on the Rooftop, uh, In That Quiet Earth, and the other one, Afterglow, plus another tune that was recorded at the same time in the same bunch of sessions that a number of us think should have been on the album. I know uh, 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 Tony Banks and I think it should have been on the album, and that's a track called Inside and Out. So we do that as well. It was only uh, issued on an EP, but it was Phil Collins' first complete lyric for the band back in the day and it uh, should have been on there. Writing the wrong, that's what you've done. Well, that's what I do, yeah, you know, it's an everything to a director's cut and a, a kind of act of restitution and restoration and all of that. Um, yeah, I have re- re-recorded a few things, usually live, but sometimes studio versions of uh, the Genesis things. In fact, uh, just recently, I guess worth breaking up, uh, you re-recorded the, uh, the big, uh, your big hit from GTR, When the Heart Rules the Mind, right? That's right, yeah. I don't know if anyone's publicly heard that yet but uh, i have um uh, redone that yeah um i'll be playing it live on the forthcoming concerts so there'll be there'll be solo stuff there'll be a um, tiny bit of gtr and then there'll be the genesis stuff but um yeah i, I really could that I, I always liked the song and i always wanted to do my own version and um, steve rothery joined me on it that's an uh, uh, additional guitar steve rothery of marillion he and I have been doing one or two things together recently, showing up on each other's things, and um, uh, we may well do a project together. So, yeah, Return to GTR, that's um, something that many people have asked if I was ever going to either play that stuff or, or reform the band, and, uh, you know, one tries. One tries at these reformations, but they're not, not always that, that easy. Uh, meanwhile, I always think the reason for doing any of those things is to celebrate the, uh, the music that people once liked, and they might like the new version. That would be cool if, uh, if that makes it out uh, at any certain point. Be interested to hear that. Oh, I know a lot of people yeah. would be. <laughs> yeah, I think it will. I think they're going to release it as a single, I believe. And if for some reason that gets overlooked, I'll stick it on an album at some point, yeah. probably later in the year. Well, I, I know there's, it's always sort of a tightrope walk when you're revisiting a lot of this stuff and you know celebrating an album like Wind and Wuthering. You know, it's a classic record yeah. and adding a... I mean, yeah. when you try to get out of that, do you try to add a new stamp to it or, or are you just serving sort of the, uh, the memory uh, of it for the fans? Well, I think, I, I think um, it was the last album I did with, with the band. I, I haven't re-recorded it as a, as, a, as a studio album. I'm just celebrating the fact that it was its 40th birthday. You know, every now and again, there'll be someone in, in the Genesis office who'll say, oh, you realize next year will be the 50th anniversary of anything that Genesis ever did, that she said, uh, but I don't think there'll be a re- reformation, do you? And I said, well, you know, I'm always open to that. But meanwhile, you know, I, I, I like to honor and celebrate things uh, for various reasons. I spent a long time, decades, doing solo stuff and rather shorter time doing or celebrating the Genesis stuff. And I, I just tell people that in 1973, when we were unable to get a, a gig practically anywhere in the States, John Lennon gave an interview and said, and that was the time we were doing Selling England by the Pound, he said that Genesis was one of the bands he was listening to. So would that we could have capitalized on it at the time with Twitter and all the rest, but you know that sort of stuff wasn't around. So decades later, it comes to light that we were one of the bands that had John Lennon's ear for even for five seconds. I, I, I was pleased with that at the time, as the other Genesis guys were. Um, it did something for us, but you know it was only the ripple effect. I like to honor the stuff, the early stuff, that, that often I find you know bandmates can often be quite dismissive of the early stuff. But I like to remind, and, um, you know, there was an audience for that. Uh, those albums did sell very well. And, uh, but it's not, all, it's, not all about, it's not all about the numbers. It's about much more than that for me. Now, you mentioned, of course, you know, when, when things start to happen like that with 50th anniversaries happening every single year at this point, 
and the reformation yeah, often, often yeah come up. There's often you know, there's often this you know missed opportunities, and uh, I like to think that I like to pull focus and say no, it doesn't have to be a, a, a missed opportunity. But I'm not going to celebrate 50 years of Genesis, but you know uh, there'll probably be yeah, I think something's going to happen with Lamb Lies Down on Broadway. God knows what a reissue, extra sleeve note. But you know this is something that that people have had already. You know, so it's, um, you know, how much of a retread can there be? Meanwhile, I continue to record new stuff, mm-hmm. um, um, and um, I'm halfway through a new album. The last right. album I did, last stu- studio album, had 20 people on it from all around the world. We had Israeli working with Palestinian, oh, you know, Azerbaijan, uh, working with Iceland, working with Hungary, United Kingdom, United States, just to mention a few, 20 people from all around the world. So I celebrate that as well. I like to celebrate all of these eras, and um, I think it, it did very well. Yeah, yeah. It being so uh, multicultural, I mean, it's a really good time yeah. to be to be doing that, to be, because it's... Wouldn't it be ridiculous if you only work with musicians from your own village? And, you know, I remember Mel Brooks doing, what was the sketch, the 2,000-year-old man, or whatever it was called, and they asked him, what was the first national anthem? And he said, yeah, I think I can remember that, something like, um, uh, God bless all those in cave 13, and to hell with all the rest. Uh, That seems to be the way the the politics is going again, so um, while politics goes Neanderthal, um, I want to go global, and I want to work with more and more people from around the world. I've been working with some Indian musicians recently. Uh, I'll be working with an orchestra with some British dates coming up soon, uh, and uh, but with an American conductor, British orchestra, American conductor, you see. So we go Anglo-American. We do that. We like to do, I think, where politics fails us. Music can do that. Music knows no borders. Neither, neither should it. And that, so, so you, you, you have been taking that whole idea that you did in the studio with the Night Siren, and that is bleeding into these these live shows as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know, I do a little bit of that. I don't do too much. Um, uh, I don't want to be too didactic about it. I don't want to pound the table. Uh, about this, but I think that, you know, my own family were a refugee family coming out of Eastern Europe, coming out of Poland, um, surviving persecution, and they were allowed into the UK in the late 1800s. Not too much trouble, it seems, except at home. So I often say to people, if you know, that um, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be standing here, you know, for all those Brexiteers and those who are anti-foreigner and anti-refugee and all that. So, um, you don't have to look too far back. I don't think we should be building walls. We should be tearing them down. We managed to tear down the Berlin Wall, didn't we? I remember seeing Paul Butterfield talking of politics and music. I remember seeing him playing in 1966 to a very small audience doing a stunning show that featured Mike Bloomfield and Elvin Bishop. But he had Howlin' Wolf's rhythm section, I believe. I believe it was Sam Lee and Jerome Arnold um, at that time. And... Uh, whilst there were race riots going on in Alabama, this was what was possible. You know, the most stunning blues show I'd ever seen. And I was listening to a lot of blues at that time. With this live record, you know, you, so you, as you're saying, you're kind of celebrating a classic album like Wind and Wuthering, as well as playing The Night Siren. Did you, when, when you construct, you know, a set list or anything, did you ever try to, to sort of blend the two concepts together? Or was it kind of an A and B side type uh, well, of thing? Yeah, I think, that, you know, I, I used to do that. And uh, I would sometimes arrange something so that, you know, I might do just the guitar solo from first to fifth, which would, you know, draw a big response. And I, I was very grateful for that. And, and a nice piece of music and, and everything. But I think what changed my mind about it was I was in Sicily. I was doing an acoustic show with Julian Colbeck and a guy showed up at the hotel and he had just about every solo album I'd ever done and I signed them all in the lobby for him and then he sheepishly had this other pile and he said I don't know how you feel about signing these and it was a Genesis album as if it was contraband and he thought I was going to hit the roof but I thought perhaps having signed those it was time to reclaim the heritage and celebrate it and that's what gave me the idea of re-recording many of those tunes, albeit with an enlarged team and, and an orchestra and guys who were from, ooh, you know, uh, like-minded bands of a similar era. So, you know, there were, over time, you know, I'd been working with guys from Yes, guys from King Crimson, um, 
guys from Jethro Tull. You know, there was all sorts of stuff that was going on, and and latterly, you know, guys from the ELP and and all the rest. And you know, the surviving members of all those bands. You know, we we all know each other. So it, it's, I guess it's it's a time where yes, I realise that to some degree, I think my job is, as Tony Banks said to me, he said, you know, you're preserving the heritage, aren't you? You know, I said yes, I feel I'm. I'm doing that. I mean, I know that you know when they reformed as a as a three piece um, some years ago. I guess you know they were preserving their idea of, of the heritage. But I think it was 20 years since Genesis last recorded anything in the studio together. But I can't answer for everyone else. So um, it's important to me to say you know it was it was important then and it's important now. I I fought hard for those songs then. I fight hard for them now, and I do enlargements of them. I, you know, often do this, or I intend to often do it with orchestra. Mm-hmm. I will be doing six dates in the UK with orchestra. Uh, so I'm kind of putting my money where my mouth is, saying I think this is um, this is important. It is worth asking. I mean, Tony and Mike have both said that they don't rule it out that you know they could do it, and obviously Phil is back out there now. Mm-hmm. Do you see the benefit of uh, and and would have an interest in going out with them another time, either touring well, or just recording? You know, I, I think you know that um, it's obvious to them that as I'm celebrating Genesis material, and I've said publicly I'm up for that. Um, you know whether it's a reformation to do something like Lamb Life Down on Broadway, which they initially approached me about. Um, I said yes, of course, yeah. If you call me if you need me, but. I think that I think it's possible, and of course, you know, the, the company line is always I wouldn't rule it out, but I think it's highly improbable, so I wouldn't rule it in either. Um, I'm I'm open to it, but I'm I'm I think the I I wouldn't rule it out line is getting a little bit, um, you know. But perhaps the timeline on that one has, has run out. Well, I mean, that's uh, I was speaking to Tony recently, and he did allude to time maybe running out if you were to give it a go for another round. Yeah, time may indeed be running out. Um, but then I had an uncle who lived until he was 108. Uh, so I, I have no intention of retiring. I seem to be getting busier. I'm doing more and more projects with, you know, I've shown up on tons and tons of albums of other people. Usually that's rock, but sometimes it's, it's some version of jazz or it's classical. I try and embrace all the, all the genres. I've got this pan-genre affectation, if you like. Call it what you will. Call it collision. Call it fusion. Call it prog. Call it anything you like. But I just I, I adore music in all its forms, and um, I intend to do that until I drop uh, and I'm very happy to do that. You know, I think music is, is, is the nearest thing to the fountain of youth. Keeps me going, keeps me focused, keeps me happy. And my, my wife loves to travel. She's um, she's a fine historian. She, God, you know, she can write books on um, subjects where she needs no source material. She's always um, completing my education by taking me off to India, where I've been working with some musicians from there. And... Um, looking at temples and discovering the history and um, many things. She, she loves to travel. So in, in that sense, it's perfect for, for the two of us. Um, anywhere we visit, she might well say to me in, in England, a little village, she might say, oh, you, you do realize this was a um, stronghold, a Roman stronghold, and they had you know a garrison, a garrison 2,000 strong here, and she'll start reeling off the figures. This place called Brampton was once called Brent Tuna. So, yeah, it's, it's an education. Yeah. There's a... I'm trying to convince her to do to do a book about 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 Greek mythology because she doesn't need any source material for that. She lives it, absolutely lives it. I've been to Greece a few times with her, and I know we'll go again. Um, I think that's her true passion. Well, there's um there's a very famous line I think that uh, well at least I've read about. I'm assuming it's true that when you were looking for a band in the early 70s, you, you put out the ad that said, looking for someone who's determined to strive beyond existing existing stagnant musical forms. And and if that's yep. true, it sounds like that's still the mantra. That's still the mantra. I think so. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, if music can retain its element of surprise, whether it's a short song or if it's um, you know Wagner's Ring Cycle or the, or, or the progressive equivalent, I don't mind. I don't mind if it's Supper's Ready. See, it's ironic that 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 with Genesis in 1972, um, I wrote something that was the pre- preamble to Supper's Ready. So the shortest song that Genesis ever did, which was 90 seconds long, I wrote, and then there's and then there's Supper's Ready, the longest thing that we ever did. You know, ironically, side by side, 
and as I say, you know, it's not it's not the form, it's not it's not it's not the length of of the play, it's the quality of the acting, it's the quality of the playing, it's the quality of the writing. I think it does. I don't really mind how long it is or how how short it is. I'll apply that to. Uh to your career and I, I hope it's uh, so much much more longer because I'm enjoying everything that you're doing out there thank you thank you yeah I'm, I'm really having a great time out there right now it's been really good we're working with a new bass player uh, another Swedish guy called um, Jonas Reingold Jonas Reingold and he's an absolute virtuoso I've heard him playing Bach on the bass and then playing jazz and then doing you know this this uh, Rickenbacker type stuff you think wow you know this guy, he learned one of the most difficult tunes I've ever been involved with in two days flat. He just, we just said, you know, we might throw this one in the set as you've got all the rest together. And, and, he, and he did. He absolutely nailed it, which is amazing. I, I wish I had a photographic memory like that. Um, but um, yeah, flying thing is photographic memory. That's it. That's, that's the best way. Well, again, uh, Weathering Nights has made for a really great list, and it's a, it's a really fun live album. And congrats on uh, getting the, the number one slot on Amazon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm really so proud of that. So thank you. A lovely talking to you. You too. And I uh, hope we get to talk again. Yeah, all right. Thank Take you. care, Steve. All the best. All right, you too. Bye. Thank you. Ciao.